was a nun, and I was dedicated. give the answers, okay? okay? You're gonna have time to write things down on paper. I guess I was one of those rarities of, of our modern times who did starve for his art. Who I really starved, you know, to have... Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, glad to be back with you guys. Uh, it's been a while uh, since I've seen you guys and since, you know, we've been um, live here on YouTube and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so yeah, welcome back. This is uh, um, this month's episode of uh, the Pan-African Film Series. Um, and my name is Rashad, and I am a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Um, our party is a, a revolutionary party, a revolutionary organization whose goals and objectives are uh, Pan-Africanism. And we define Pan-Africanism as the total unification and liberation of Africa under one scientific socialist government. And so, yeah, that, that's what we're, um, as we say all the time, that's what we're focused on. That's what we're uh, geared towards. And um, sorry, <laughs> that's what we're geared towards. And that's, you know, that's what our um, organizing efforts are um, go towards, um, the total uh, liberation and unification of Africa. Um, and so, yeah, so, that's um um that's that that's what we're that's what we're organizing for and also what we like to do is land acknowledgements so also i am uh out of uh so-called denver colorado um occupied Ute territory and um we do the land acknowledgements just to you know help everybody understand um and to constantly reinforce the idea and the uh, the the true um the truth that this is not our land um this is this belongs to the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere of uh, North and South America and um, the Caribbean, um, all the way up from you know the top of Canada to the bottom of Peru. This is not our land. This is their land, and so we always want to acknowledge that and um, acknowledge um, whose land we're actually on. And so yeah, that's um, I'm out of here. You know, so called Denver, Colorado. Um, so yeah, today we're gonna watch a documentary. Um, called uh Aristide and the Endless Revolution. It's a documentary about um Haiti and um their continued resistance against imperialism um and foreign domination from the US 
and uh, from nations like the U.S., Canada, France, and even its neighbors, um, the Dominican Republic. Um, and also we'll talk about, you know, Jamaica's role and everything and like that, um, Jamaica's role in um, the destabilization of Haiti as well. But yeah, this documentary fo focuses, um, it has, you know, it focuses on Haiti, obviously, uh, but through the lens of the, uh, of um, what happened to uh, John, uh, John Claude R. Steed, who was the first democratically elected president of Haiti, um, who was ousted in multiple coups um, um, about 10 years apart. Um, and so, yeah, so this 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 uh, documentary discusses that. And um, I, I do have to give like a content warning before we start, because there is um, obviously unfortunate scenes of um, um, the loss of life. And, you know, there there are um, people in the street, um, um, bodies and stuff like that and um, dead bodies in the street. And it's discussed in the film as well. And um, um, so, yeah, there's there some pretty like gruesome images. And so, yeah, I definitely want to give a content warning um, for anybody. And it kind of like there it's kind of splattered throughout. Um, there's a decent amount in the end. Um, and it involves a whole discussion about um, international journalists coming to the uh, um, coming to Haiti and documenting some of these things. And so, yeah, I just want to give a content warning before we start and say that there is um, images of dead bodies and um um, yeah, the loss of human life, which is extremely, extremely sad. And it's just the way it's, yeah. So we'll just, I just want to give, uh, give that content warning before we start, but yeah, I'm ready to, um, jump right in. And so we'll watch this. It's about an hour and 30 minutes and then we'll come back, um, afterwards and we'll discuss it, um, after it ends. So, yep, here it goes. Early. On February 29, 2004, the President of Haiti called upon the international community to protect his government from a rebel army advancing on the capital, Port-au-Prince. Hours later, however, President Jean-Bertrand Aristide found himself on a U.S. military jet, surrounded by Marines, being escorted to an unknown destination. Back in Haiti, Hundreds of members of his party and cabinet were arrested and imprisoned. More than a year later, as he watches the last remaining months of his term expire, Aristide remains defiant towards those he says forced him into exile for the second time in 15 years. I am still the only elected president of Haiti. They voted for a president. A good number, unfortunately, were killed for that, for defending an elected president. C'est la première fois dans l'histoire du monde qu'un chef d'État élu démocratiquement élu d'un pays souverain est kidnappé par le force spéciale d'un autre État souverain. President Aristide told me uh, that he'd been forced uh, from his home, that he had literally been kidnapped. They told him if he did not leave, he would be killed, and a lot of other Haitians would be killed. Every time the Haitian majority has been allowed to go to the polls, it has voted for the same people with the same agenda. Each time that agenda was pursued, the government was overthrown by military force. Aristide represented a people's reform movement and was trying for the first time ever in Haitian history to be the voice of the voiceless. This was again the Haitian people in power with all the warts and all the sloppiness and anarchy that come with a, a newly born government. As we attempt to understand how a president so overwhelmingly elected by his people lost the support of the international community, we are confronted by those who defend Aristide and accuse the United States of orchestrating his removal. This is not a, about uh, anything but the ideology of the far right wing that now really controls the United States government that does not support popular democracy. Orders from on high are that we are to concentrate on this question. Just how much was Aristide responsible? But we don't have to follow the orders from on high. And if we're sensible, we see that the only question was how it would implode. But we are also confronted by those who blame the collapse on Aristide himself. There wasn't any question that things were going to fall apart in Haiti. The immediate roots are part of the tragedy of Aristide. This man failed to deliver. Hopes crashed. 
President Aristide didn't just make mistakes. He willfully misgoverned, and eventually he paid the price for that because he lost uh, his ability to control the whirlwind of violence that he had unleashed on the country for a decade. As the bitterly partisan debate about one of the most controversial figures of the 20th century continues to rage, it remains clear that Haiti is in crisis. I saw things that people are never supposed to see, uh, that just inhuman bodies that you just see. I mean, their daily life is to walk by a body that's being eaten by a dog because it was killed, you know, the night before. It's a setback that's, that's multiple decades backwards. Everything's broken, um, and everybody knows it. Aristide was not perfect, but he represented an institution. If allowed to grow and prosper, it symbolized another relationship that Haiti would have to the world. The justice that Aristide fought for, that the Haitian people demand, is still existing. Haiti is poor as that. Children are still dying. It is, the, the situation of Haiti defies logic. To see the Haitian people living like that is incredible. My hair is standing on the back of my head right now as I'm talking to you. This is such a waste. This is so indignified. This is a crime against humanity. Je connais Aristide depuis 1982 et au moment où il a été ordonné prêtre. Et j'ai suivi son évolution, son engagement dans la théologie de la libération et aux côtés bon, des jeunes. While Father Gir Poulard came to oppose Aristide's presidency, and now serves a small wealthy parish in Jacmel. He recalls his former colleague's commitment to social change. Après euh, plus de 20 ans de dictature et du valériste, euh, la population haïtienne aspirait à autre chose. Moi, je sentais en lui un homme qui était euh, animé pas seulement de bonne volonté, mais qui, qui était et pris, on dirait, par les problèmes de son peuple. Dr. Paul Farmer, an American physician and anthropologist who has worked in Haiti's impoverished Central Plateau for 25 years, agrees with Father Poulard. The majority of his inspiration comes from listening to very, very poor parishioners, people living in slums, people who are child servants, women who have many children but don't have any stable employment. And, and that was the focus of his own ministry as a priest. Farmer's Clinic has grown into an impressive medical and educational complex and serves as a model for bringing health care to the world's poorest communities. Farmer himself has been outspoken in his support for Haiti's embattled former president. When you look back at people who adopt ideas that are uh, unnerving to the powerful, the idea, for example, that the Haitian poor just want poverty with dignity and base, a few basic rights, you know, clean water to go to school, etc., those are profoundly disturbing ideas in some circles. And they're profoundly popular ideas among the poor themselves. Already well known as a tireless advocate for the poor, in the late 1980s, Aristide began drawing attention for his fervent criticism of the military and foreign domination of the country. Si vraiment ils reconnaissent avoir volé, si vraiment ils reconnaissent avoir volé à travers leurs compatriotes tout au long du processus de colonisation, si vraiment ils veulent dire à la face du monde entier qu'ils sont développés, qu'ils commencent 
à ne pas avoir pitié d'Haïti. Nous n'avons pas besoin de pitié, nous. Qu'il commence à ne pas avoir pitié de nous, mais à reconnaître le droit que nous avons, droit de récupérer un peu de ce qu'ils ont volé. Alors, alors, ils pourront se dire des personnes humaines qui transcendent le matériel pour déboucher sur une dimension spirituelle où la personne humaine se développe continuellement et n'ose pas appeler quelqu'un qui l'a exploité un sous-développé quand lui-même il est le premier sous-développé. Aristide's passionate speeches chastising the world's wealthier powers not only had an impact in Haiti, but within the international community as well. John Shattuck, who served throughout the globe as the Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights in the Clinton administration, recalls Aristide's significance following the Duvalier dictatorships. Aristide represented a people's reform movement and genuinely, I think, was trying for the first time ever in Haitian history, at least in modern history, to uh, be the voice of the voiceless, the voice of the people who had previously had no source of support and who were constantly the victims of a corrupt elite and a military regime. Aristide and others like him are, are, are the opposite, are the result of the Duvalier years. The Duvaliers were there for 30 years almost and created a society that, that's completely immoral. For over 30 years, Francois Duvalier and later his son Jean-Claude ruled Haiti as dictators, dominating the population with brutality. Using a ruthless militia of loyalists known as the Tonton Makout, the Duvaliers expropriated millions of dollars from the Haitian treasury and committed countless human rights abuses. When a popular uprising finally forced Jean-Claude from power in 1986, he fled to France, leaving in his wake a nation ravaged by chaos and violence. Ray Laforest, now a human rights activist, remembers growing up under the Duvalier regime. To Duvalier represented a complete lack of respect for life, abuse, raping of women and children and families, a degradation of the society, just naked aggression, a neo-fascist system. Jean-Claude Duvalier's departure left both a political and security vacuum in Haiti. And for the next three years, former Tonton Makout and army loyalists battled over control of the country, killing countless civilians. In 1990, the international community finally decided it had seen enough unrest, and a UN mission was dispatched to Haiti to oversee a presidential election. Father Aristide, refusing to be intimidated by multiple assassination attempts and the burning of his church and orphanage, decided to run for the presidency. Aristide called his party Lavalas, or the People's Flood and his grassroots campaign and fiery populist rhetoric instantly connected with the people tired of oppression and suffering. President Aristide came out of City Soleil. He was a priest who spoke Creole and talked with the people and communicated. Prior to that time, people in power spoke French. And up comes this priest talking to poor people. And yes, he created for them hope. He communicated with them and he led the way uh, to change. In the same way, the people who are going to be a great people, a great people, a great people, a great people. Today, President Aristide lives in exile in South Africa. When we spoke with him there, he described the challenge of trying to work with a society dangerously divided into wealthy elites and millions of poor. We said we should not create a kind of war where rich fighting poor and poor fighting against rich, but a kind of place where rich and poor can work together. He's simply saying to the property classes, you have to give a little more to the poor. 
we want to move from abject misery to dignified poverty. That was his, that was his program. But those in Haiti's elite class who opposed Aristide's social reforms accuse him of being divisive. En prenant la lutte, ça de lutte des classes, là il a tout cassé. Et je crois, il fallait évidemment prôner le partage parce que il faut le reconnaître qu'en Haïti, notre élite n'a pas travaillé suffisamment à la promotion des masses. But Danny Glover, a political activist, actor, and close friend of Aristide, who's been following events in Haiti for over 30 years, disagrees. To, to raise the minimum wage just slightly, which was what Aristide attempted to do, to bring uh, medical services to that island, uh, which has not only inadequate medical services, but is one of the leading countries in the region in terms of HIV AIDS. To bring those things to that island were very minimal things that you do for people who you consider to be human beings. Not all Aristide's opposition came from within Haiti. 600 miles to the north, the U.S. government had its own ideas for the upcoming election. Noam Chomsky, a professor at MIT who has written extensively about Haiti, remembers the American reaction to Aristide's candidacy. Finally, in 1990, Haiti had its first democratic election. The U.S. was appalled by the outcome. Uh, the victor was a populist priest, Aristide, whose support had come from a lively civil society that had developed in the slums and the hills that nobody was paying any attention to, just poor people. And the idea that they would elect their own president was outrageous. Uh, the U.S. at once moved to try to undermine the democratic government withdrew aid, transferred aid to opposition elements. Before Aristide had even entered the race, the U.S. government had put millions of dollars behind the campaign of a former World Bank official, Mark Bazet. Despite this support, on December 16, 1990, Jean-Bertrand Aristide became the first democratically elected president of Haiti with a staggering 67% of the vote. It was a boldly voiced mandate. But while the Haitian people rejoiced, Aristide's opponents, both in Haiti and within the U.S. government, began to explore more palatable options. When the United States picked Mark Bazin to be the candidate, he comes out with a scraggly guy who's talking about union rights, who's talking about, you know, we have an education of the Haitian people. And because he was able to bring them together so well, I mean, within three months of being a candidate, I said, won the election with a huge plurality, the U.S. was extremely terrified of the potential for our state. Aristide's talk of union rights and higher minimum wages in Haiti put at stake for the U.S. business community 20,000 assembly line jobs contracted at less than 50 cents a day by corporations like Disney and Walmart. Sweatshop labor formerly protected by the island's heavily armed elites and political instability. The forces that were at work were long-standing um, supporters of the old regime in Haiti, particularly the old military regime, but also the, some of the Haitian elites there were support for those elites in the, in the old regime in the U.S. Congress. Once we have election, where we will not have weapons, bloodshed, but on an equal basis, human being freely choosing people they want to lead them then we would feed our democratic process then we would break with the tradition of moving from one coup d'etat to another coup d'etat that moving from one democratic election to another one that was the goal aristide represented a threat to them because aristide 
was the voice of the 85% of the country who had never been heard. If that can happen in Haiti, then it could happen in Colombia, and it's obviously happened in Venezuela, it can happen in Peru, and, and so on down the line. And they do not want those kind of popular democracies because they believe that they will confront U.S. economic interests. In 1990, Haiti had the first free, fair, democratic elections when I became president. Seven months later, it could happen. At that time, Bush's father was the president of the United States. The 1991 coup was carried out by the Haitian army, whose leadership was trained by the CIA and at the Fort Benning Infantry School in the United States. Although Aristide was restored to office by President Clinton in 1994, he had only a year left in his term. When René Preval won the elections that followed, Aristide became the first Haitian president ever to peacefully hand over power to another elected leader. After regaining the presidency in the 2000 elections, Aristide was forced out of office for the second time in early 2004. Today, he sees a clear connection between the two coups. In 2004, a kidnapping happened. They kidnapped me, which is also a coup. And Bush's son is the president. Somehow, something can be linked to find the reason that happened twice. So I think they wanted to continue what they started in 1991 through the first coup. Hold on a second. Hold on a second, please. President Aristide uh, resigned. Uh, he has left his country. Uh, the Constitution of Haiti is working. There is an interim president. Uh, as per the Constitution, uh, in place. Uh, I have uh, ordered the deployment of Marines as the leading element of an interim international force to help bring uh, order and stability to Haiti. I have done so uh, in working with the international community. This government believes it is essential that Haiti have a hopeful future. Uh, this is the beginning of a new chapter in the country's history. Uh, I would urge the people of Haiti to reject violence, to give this uh, break from the past a chance to work, and the United States is prepared to help. Thank you. Again, the world watched as Haiti descended into violence and chaos. But this time, the circumstances surrounding Aristide's departure are far less certain. One area of uncertainty is the morning of February 29th, when Aristide left Haiti. It is known that he departed on a U.S. military jet, and that he was kept unaware of his eventual destination. After more than 20 hours in the air, he was deposited in the Central African Republic, a nation the United States has no diplomatic ties with. Ira Kurzban, who served as general counsel to Aristide's administration, elaborates. 
when he wouldn't turn over the uh, resignation letter, uh, they threatened to uh, uh, let the plane fly out and leave him there uh, at the airport stranded without any security at all. This was the ultimate gun to uh, someone's head. They used intimidation, coercion, and then after they got him on the plane, basically kidnapped them and refused to tell them where they were going, refused to allow them to even look out the windows. U.S. officials in both Washington and Haiti were quick to respond. The idea that someone was abducted is just totally inconsistent with everything I heard or saw or uh, am aware of. He was not kidnapped. We did not force him onto the airplane. He went onto the airplane willingly, uh, and that's the truth. We didn't request his departure. You went yesterday to the palace at night? No, I did not. Did the U.S. push President Aristide out of power? President Aristide made a decision for the good of Haiti and I think... Roger Noriega, the current Assistant Secretary of State for the Western Hemisphere, echoed his colleagues' denials. We did conclude, uh, because of his failure to take advantage of opportunities over the years, uh, that he probably wasn't going to be able to govern uh, the country. But uh, uh, in the final analysis, the decision for him to leave was a decision that he made. And although the U.S. State Department presented to the world what effectively amounts to a letter of resignation, even some members of Congress are skeptical. In March of 2004, congressional hearings were held in Washington to investigate the ongoing crisis in Haiti and the role played by the U.S. government in Aristide's removal. Among those testifying were Timothy Carney, a former U.S. ambassador to Haiti, and Orlando Marville, a senator from Barbados who has monitored Haitian elections for the Organization of American States, the OAS. Both now serve on the board of the Haiti Democracy Project, the most powerful anti-Aristide lobby in Washington. Many for calling these hearings. Let me take advantage of the ambassadors that are here and, and uh, ask them, uh, what does coup d'etat mean as relates to uh, American understanding of the international understanding of that French term, coup d'etat. Ambassador Connie, I'm going to ask Ambassador Marvel as well, but since both of you are professional diplomats, what does it mean to you? Uh, a, a blow against the state, if you will, the forcible uh, seizure of power, uh, and there are any number of ways to perpetrate one. There was a book, in fact, done in the mid-60s by uh, Edward Lutwak. That's good for me, though. Uh, I concur with that. It's a forcible takeover of power, but uh, that's an old definition. And uh, I think one is moving towards the definition of a takeover by force, a subtle takeover, a soft coup, okay. a hard coup, and so on. Let's take an academic thing. From what we know, from what Secretary Noriega said, what does not make this a coup d'etat as ambassadors understand it? Rebels, force, fear, flee. When we interviewed both diplomats, they again stopped short of calling Aristide's departure a coup. But they underscored the U.S. decision to facilitate his removal. As you appreciate, Aristide had an American guard, not Haitian. And he asked the guards if they were prepared to stand up and fight to the end. And they said no. As I gather, he went to the U.S. Embassy and asked if they would do something about it. And they said no. I think if you, if you look at Haiti and Aristide and the United States, you are inescapably led to the logic that the international community, those who care about Haiti, looked at Aristide and found him inadequate. Yet some of those who Carney describes as dissatisfied with Aristide's presidency have been more than just bystanders to Haiti's political wars. The Washington-based Haiti Democracy Project, which Carney now chairs, is largely funded by the Boulos family, a Haitian conglomerate that owns several media outlets constantly used to lambaste President Aristide. The group of 184, another anti-Aristide organization, is also headed by an American, Andy Aped, the president of Alpha Industries, one of the oldest and largest assembly factories in Haiti. The leader of the opposition financially supported by the United States, 
is an American citizen, Andy Apet, who owns sweatshops in Haiti, and he opposed the rise of the minimum wage when President Aristide said the minimum wage has to be raised from 38 cents a day to a dollar a day. But are these interests significant enough to topple the government? I well, mean, they were significant enough to have a coup in 1991 when President Aristide was first there, and, and obviously the U.S. military helped. So the answer is yes, I think they are significant enough in the United States government's view. The United States does not want popular democracy in the Western Hemisphere. Popular democracy meaning people who are democratically elected who want to represent the vast majority of people within their country. That's the fight with Chavez. That was the fight with Allende. That was the fight with Michael Manley in Jamaica. And that's the fight with Aristide. Except Haiti is a much poorer country, much easier to topple, much easier to uh, have uh, a coup there. This is not a about uh, anything but the ideology of the far right wing that now really controls the United States government that does not support popular democracy. They don't believe in it. They believe in working with the elites in these countries and using the military or using intelligence sources in these countries to keep control. In other words, we simply do not accept challenges to our authority and prestige. Uh, if they occur, we're entitled to use violence or terror or uh, strangulation and so on. In this region, the, and in fact, by now, you know, in the world, the U.S. is to reign supreme. Actually, in Haiti, what we have is a real genocide. The huge majority of the people are lavalas, they are in hiding. So, unfortunately, convicted people, well financed once by foreign hands and now well protected by those same hands, they continue to kill people, arrest others, put them in jail. So it's real genocide where the U.S. bear the responsibility. Yet not all in Haiti were affected by the violence and chaos of the 2004 coup. In Pechenville, where many of the elites who opposed Aristide's presidency live behind locked gates and armed guards, we asked if such a violent overthrow could have been avoided. A sociologist and writer well known in both Haiti and abroad, Lenik Urbon, opposed Aristide's presidency. La transition qu'on voulait à Aristide c'était pas d'abord le départ d'Alcide comme tel. C'était une transition qui permettait de maîtriser la police qui était truffée de bandits introduits par Aristide, habillés même en policier par Aristide, et, euh, une, et des moyens pour juguler euh, les, les, les gangs euh, que Aristide appelait les bases, euh, les bases de son parti. De ce sens, c'était ça le problème principal. Donc on en voulait Aristide pour ça. Et donc, si on arrivait à contrôler cela, Aristide aurait pu rester au pouvoir. Mais Aristide n'a même pas compris cela. Claude Moïse, un historien et le éditeur du conservateur haitien paper Le Matin, aussi owned par la Boulos family, suggests Aristide's departure was necessary. But the community international wanted a solution to negotiate. So the solution to negotiate, it needed to be with the two parties. Otherwise, dit Aristide on one side and the opposition on the other. So the community international wanted to go to the end. But at the moment where she realized that there was nothing to do and that the situation risked to bask in a total anarchy, at that moment, they were intervened and they said to Aristide that there was nothing to do, you have to go to L'événement qui a fait perdre à Haïti tout son crédit, c'est d'abord les élections de l'an 2000. On sentait que les Haïtiens croyaient qu'ils allaient vers un certain progrès de la démocratie, 
Or, on a vu qu'Aristide a tenté de manipuler et il a réussi. Là, on a trouvé ça extrêmement suspect. C'est à partir de là qu'on voyait que Aristide s'accrochait à un pouvoir qu'il voulait absolu. Toute la crise va se développer autour des élections jusqu'à la chute d'Aristide. The controversy that arose during the parliamentary elections in May of 2000 in Haiti posed a new kind of challenge for Aristide. First, his opponents accused the Lavalas party of stealing eight Senate seats. In the months that followed, leading up to the presidential elections in November of that same year, the controversy gained momentum and the international community leapt at the chance to condemn Aristide's party. Aristide again won the presidency with an overwhelming majority, this time by 91%. And although the results of his election were never seriously questioned, the controversy surrounding the parliamentary elections was used by the opposition and the media to stain his presidency. They lied by creating the confusion between two different elections. One was in March, the other one was in November. The presidential election was in November. Two different elections. But they lies by creating the confusion as if it were just one single election. When we spoke with Ira Kurzban in Miami, he blamed the controversy on the Bush administration. They saw after the May 2000 election that the Famille Lavalas party was going to be in power for the next 20 or 30 years. This was not only about Aristide and was not, I would even say, principally about Aristide. It was really about the destruction of the Lavalas party, because the Lavalas party is what represented the majority interest. At the congressional hearings in 2004, Secretary Noriega again tried to use the 2000 parliamentary elections to question the legitimacy of Aristide's second term. And the fraudulent parliamentary elections once again in May 2000. This series of farcical electoral exercises. I was there, Mr. Noriega. Let's really understand what the fraudulent elections are all about so that the American people understand them. The elections themselves were relatively well, well done, given the situation in Haiti at the time. It was about whether the certain runoff for seven Senate seats would occur. Is that a fair statement, Mr. Noriega? Yes, it is an accurate statement. Thank you. However, when we spoke with Orlando Marville in Barbados, who led the OAS team responsible for monitoring those elections, he argued that the controversy over the eight Senate seats cannot be so easily dismissed. Everybody had put everything into this electoral process, believing it would be clean. In the senatorial vote, Fami Lavalas was winning, but they were not winning everything. When we realized that the counting was strange, we sat down, went through it again, and said, there's been some fishing here. There's some, something strange going on. According to the Haitian Constitution, to be elected as a senator, one must receive an absolute majority of votes, at least 51%. If no candidate obtains a majority, the law requires a runoff. The OAS election observers, however, concluded that the Electoral Council had declared eight Lavala senators victorious who had not achieved an absolute majority. While all eight had been the leading candidates, a runoff was required for their elections to be valid. I drafted a letter to the president, René Poival, and to the president of the Electoral Council. And the president called me in the following day and I said, look, this is a simple matter. He's winning, all he has to do is to say, have the second elections and we're home. Just for these senators? Yes. Yet it is not entirely clear how Aristide himself, who held no official position at the time, can be blamed for the council's refusal to hold a runoff election. President Aristide, as soon as he was elected, um, had seven of those eight senators resign their seats, and President Aristide sent a letter to the OAS saying that they would redo that election. In the letter, Aristide first stated, I am now in a position to inform you that the seven contested senators have resigned. The letter also asked the council to set the date for elections of the contested seats in a timely manner.
and the APED's group of 184 joined with the Democratic Convergence, a political conglomerate partly funded by the U.S. government, to form the opposition voice that instigated much of the electoral crisis. Notre position au niveau de la plateforme démocratique est claire. Il faut le départ de Jean-Bertrand Aristide comme premier élément de solution de cette crise. So they just continued to raise the bar, to continue to make it clear that, that they were um, not going to accept any surrender. They were taking no prisoners. They wanted Aristide out. The opposition, of course, knew that it couldn't win in a general election. Uh, uh, you could have observers from, uh, from all over the world, and they couldn't win. You could have every vote counted and recounted and counted and recounted again, they couldn't win. So the only way in which they could actually assert themselves and take power was to create the kind of crisis and conflict that, that, uh, uh, that ensued. Those eight contested seats were ultimately used as the excuse for a full-scale embargo on Haiti, uh, which was really designed uh, not to do anything about those eight seats, but really designed to topple the Lavalas government. With a population of nearly eight million, a jobless rate hovering near 70 percent, a well-armed elite unwilling to pay taxes, and a federal budget of only 300 million dollars, Haiti was a nation most desperately in need of foreign aid. Yet throughout the 1990s and into this millennium, the U.S. government blocked the international financial institutions from helping the first democratically elected government in Haiti's history. With few financial resources to maintain control of an impoverished nation, President Aristide frequently spoke out against the embargo. And the embargo was the beginning, really, of the end of democratic rule in Haiti because it was designed by the United States, along with support from Canada and France, to destabilize the government. What you saw as the Bush administration came in was a tightening noose around Haiti, which really, uh, that is to say, a almost total embargo and, and virtually no, uh, not only any assistance going in, but really a, a, a fairly sharp embargo that prevented uh, the kind of support coming in that would have assisted Haiti uh, to get back on its feet. Do you think that the U.S. embargo might be responsible for the collapse of Aristide's regime? Well, it's ridiculous. Uh, what's called an embargo, by the way, uh, began in the year 2000. Uh, and that was a decision on the part of the Clinton administration to link the dispersal of international financial assistance to Haiti on the reaching of a political settlement that would be a viable democratic uh, solution to Haiti's problems. However, in April of 2001, the U.S. representative to the IDB wrote a letter to the bank's president. The letter acknowledges that the bank approved six loans to Haiti, but concludes, 
We do not believe that these loans should be treated in a routine manner, and strongly urge you to not authorize disbursement. According to Brian Con Cannon, a human rights lawyer who has worked in Haiti for nearly 20 years, the letter violated two rules of the IDB Charter. First, it was a violation of the bank's internal rules because once a loan was all set and ratified, there was no process for stopping it uh, in, in mid-flight. The second thing is the IDB Charter holds that it should not be used for political purposes, and this was clearly a, a political use, and so they basically just came in and bullied the, the IDB to, to stop those loans. But despite the IDB's unprecedented reversal, the Haitian government was asked to service the debt on the $500 million they never received. They prevent Haiti to get that money, and they oblige us to pay $5 million as interest for the money, which they still kept at that time. Although the Bush administration continually argues that the United States has given more than $850 million in aid to Haiti over the last decade, Maxine Waters and Jeffrey Sachs, one of the world's leading macroeconomists, point out that none of that money went to the Aristide government. People know that the figure that the chairman and others referred to today of $850 million did not go to uh, the Aristide government. Uh, how many people understand that there's a difference between bilateral aid that goes directly to the government and the funding of non-government organizations. How many people understand that? Understood. Yeah. Congresswoman? Yes, please respond quickly. Uh, yes, uh, ver very, very quickly. I spoke with President Aristide in early 2001. He laid out a very sensible, responsible economic vision that and wanted to work with the Inter-American Development Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. And thus, I was particularly shocked to come back to Washington to find a U.S.-imposed freeze on all of those institutions. How many people know that if you don't have that kind of aid, you have no money for the infrastructure, you have no money to clean up the water, you have no money for the police, you have no money for the fire, and while Mr. Aristide has been blamed for not doing anything about poverty, do you understand how he was strangled uh, by the lack of aid, bilateral or otherwise? How many me, people understand that? Let me speak as a macroeconomist to say that it's even worse than that because they drained him of foreign exchange reserves as he continued to service the debts to the international institutions. The exchange rate collapsed, the inflation rose, and the economy collapsed. And that was the deliberate result of the strangulation of aid. Well, I hope we can get rid of some of the lies and misconceptions the about all of this money that has gone to the government when, in fact, it has not. The and I don't want to hear expired. that said anymore. So I just wanted to get that on the, the record. Lady's time has expired. Thank you so very much. By withdrawing all financial aid, not only from the United States, France, Canada, the European Union, but also the United States using its considerable power in the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, and the IMF, using all of those to create a full-scale economic embargo so not one penny of money went to the Haitian government between the year 2000 and February 29, 2004. Without shutting off all assistance to the Western Hemisphere's poorest country, it would have not been possible to, you know, to have uh, such a small number of even heavily armed people um, you know, sweep through Haiti. The United States wanted to prevent Haiti to go through a democratic process. They gave weapons to thugs from Santo Domingo to Haiti. They went to kill people. Every year they spent about 55 million U.S. dollars and last year it went up to 70 million U.S. dollars financing thugs, convicted people, political parties. Even James Dobbins, who worked in Haiti on behalf of both the Clinton and Bush administrations and is now a consultant for the Rand Corporation in Washington, acknowledges the mistake. I think that the decision to cut off all assistance to Haiti in 2000, a decision which wasn't just American, by the way, but which Europe uh, um, uh, agreed to, 
um, uh, is directly responsible for the disintegration of Haitian institutions uh, and the weakness which would allow 200 armed criminals to overthrow the government. And as James Dobbin suggests, it is not only the U.S. government that has been blamed for Haiti's descent into chaos. For Napoleon's France, Haiti was the Republic's most valuable colony in the New World, capable of generating immense wealth on the backs of the island's enslaved population of Africans. By the summer of 1800, however, a freed slave named Toussaint Louverture had taken advantage of the constant skirmishes between the Spanish and French to form a formidable army of his own. In January of 1801, Toussaint expelled the European powers from Haiti, freed the slaves, created a constitution, and became governor of the island. Napoleon, however, would not be denied, and behind an invasion the following year, forced Toussaint to lay down his arms and retire. A few weeks later, Haiti's first liberator was accused of plotting an uprising, kidnapped and sent to France, where he died in a prison in April of 1803. The French refused to formally recognize Haiti as an independent nation, and the island's inhabitants lived in constant fear of their former colonizer. In 1825, the French sent 14 warships into the harbor of Port-au-Prince, and under the threat of reoccupation and restitution of slavery, coerced Haitian President Jean-Pierre Boyer to pay France 90 million gold francs in exchange for diplomatic recognition. The debt has been a stranglehold on the Haitian economy, ever since. In an attempt to remove this burden, on the bicentennial of Toussaint's death in April of 2003, in a bold and desperate speech, Aristide called upon France to return the money, which his government calculated to equal over 21 billion dollars. Il nous faut premièrement restitution, deuxièmement réparation. Parce qu'en 1825, sous le gouvernement de Boyer, nous avons dû payer 90 millions de francs or à la France. Aujourd'hui, nous réclamons au moins la valeur capitalisée pour l'année 2003, soit 21 milliards 685 millions 135 571.48 dollars US. C'est vrai qu'au cours du 19e siècle, la France a négocié très dur les conditions de la reconnaissance diplomatique d'Haïti et a imposé à ce gouvernement, ce qu'on ne pourrait évidemment absolument plus faire aujourd'hui, de payer une dette pour les spoliations des colons français. Enfin, ce sont des choses qui seraient inconcevables aujourd'hui et qui ont lourdement pesé sur l'économie d'Haïti pendant tout le 19e siècle. Mais ça appartient à l'histoire, on ne peut pas revenir sur des conditions historiques qui ne seraient plus du tout les mêmes aujourd'hui, pas plus qu'on ne pourra demander aux Espagnols de payer, pour, de faire des réparations pour les crimes commis par les conquistadors. Tout ça n'a pas de sens, l'histoire tourne. Pour le président Aristide, however, historical injustices ne peuvent pas être so easily forgotten. Je ask respectfully to France on behalf of the Haitian government and the Haitian people to be paid because this money belongs to the people of Haiti. To press the issue with France, the Aristide government ran commercials like this one on Haitian national television, connecting an historical injustice with Haiti's current economic crisis. Aujourd'hui, la France est là pour coopérer, elle va coopérer avec Haïti, elle souhaite le faire, développer cette coopération, mais pas euh, à la suite d'un calcul de boutiquier, inspiré d'ailleurs par des avocats américains, rembourser un, un argent qu'elle ne considère pas devoir. There's no doubt that the issue of reparations hurt the French a good deal, no matter what they said. 
and I personally worked on the reparations case. I was the lawyer who was going to bring the action on behalf of the Haitian government on reparations. And I can tell you the Haitian government had a very strong case that would have embarrassed the French government. They knew it, despite their denials and saying, oh, this is nonsense and so forth. They were so concerned about it that they stole legal documents. Their consul in Haiti somehow got internal legal documents regarding uh, the claims that were going to be made against the French government. So as much as they were saying publicly that this was something that was not that important, they were busy trying to find out everything they could about the action that was going to be brought against them. The difference between the Haitian case for restitution is that it is a strong legal case as well. Haiti was the subject of multiple trade and diplomatic embargoes from 1804 on. Haiti's claims, even a hundred years ago, you know, they, they were outlined in legal documents and treaties, and the threat of force was used to, and, and restoration of slavery, was used to push Haiti into signing these uh, unfavorable agreements with France. Ricard is familiar with Farmer's criticism. Ah oui, Paul Farmer a été un soutien inconditionnel d'Aristide sur ce dossier de la réparation. C'est un peu dommage parce que Paul Farmer est une grande figure, quelqu'un qui a fait un travail admirable en Haïti, mais il s'est lancé dans cette histoire avec une naïveté qui nous a tous surpris et il a euh, suivi les, les idées d'Aristide à un point absolument incroyable, car en fait ces idées ne tenaient pas debout. For Rico Dupuis, a Haitian journalist for Radio Soleil, Aristide's request was a mistake. Look, you don't fight two major powers at the same time. They're going to come at you with, with full strength, full force. That may have been the mistake of Aristide. Not that Aristide's demand is a illegitimate. Haiti has a valid case for restitution. When I met with President Chirac twice, I openly and respectfully said, we would wish that we could celebrate together those 200 years of freedom as universal value. And he said yes. But as we know in diplomacy, sometimes you say yes to do the opposite. C'est une situation particulière. Aucun pays en Amérique, aucun pays en Amérique latine, aucun pays dans les Caraïbes n'a eu à subir cette extorsion de fonds qu'a subi Haïti, qui a hypothéqué gravement et sévèrement son développement économique et social. Do you think it was unwise for Aristide to press France for reparations? Evidently, yeah. Evidently, it was very unwise because, you know, let's look at it this way. Was Haiti too poor to ask for help? I mean, that's pitiful. You're basically saying that if you don't have the, the resources to back you up, uh, you know, legally, militarily, economically, don't bother pressing for justice. He knew that the government had no money. And I think this was one of the ways in which I think Haiti would have gotten money, quite frankly, from the French government had the case been pursued. So I think he had no other alternative but to pursue other avenues of, of obtaining funds for Haiti. With a depleted national treasury and no access to foreign aid, a disbanded army and a police force crippled by the U.S. embargo, an already tenuous security situation in Haiti rapidly deteriorated. In the fall of 2003, a group of so-called rebels, supported by those in opposition to Aristide's presidency, and armed with American-made M-16s, seized control of the northern Haitian city of Gonaïve and began to move on the capital, Port-au-Prince. The thugs who had come out of exile, who had taken over Ghana, even then Cape Haitian, Mr. Guy Philippe, Mr. Louis Jodel Chamblain, Mr. Jean Tantou, uh, we didn't feel that they just came in out of the blue. We felt that they were organized, that they came in uh, cooperating with the opposition. We felt that the United States, Canada, and France knew about it, and they literally just used the uh, killers to help pull off the coup d'etat. Louis Jodel Chamblain has been convicted of murder twice. And Guy Philippe, the face of the coup with ties to the U.S. Defense Department, has been implicated in numerous human rights abuses. And according to Ira Kurzban, they armed their insurgency with weapons from the U.S. government. Uh, we have proof, for example, that those rebels were armed with M-16s, uh, which the United States had given to the Dominican uh, military a year before in a special operation. We know that the people who were in charge of the so-called rebels, 
about 80 or 100 of them, first of all, were fully trained and integrated into the Dominican Army, something that the Dominican Army would never do without getting the green light from uh, the Defense Department in the United States. In order to have a coup, you have to have planning and resources, finances, especially when there's no military in the country anymore, when the military has been um, demobilized. Yet, while Aristide's decision to disband the army meant the military could no longer move against the government as it had in 1991, John Shattuck argues it left a dangerous security void. One thing that Aristide did, which was principled, idealistic in some ways, but I think in the end a big mistake, was to completely abolish the army. Um, and he abolished the army so that there was no Haitian capacity for keeping law and order and security. Both the Haitian people and the international community, however, welcomed Aristide's decision. When I came to office, this army involved in leading coup after coup, led a coup instead of protecting democracy and the rights of the people. When I went back in 1994, this army, after killing more than 5,000 people, the people were asking me to disband the army. I obey in any democracy within the framework of law of your constitution, you take care of the will of the people. But the disbanding of the Haitian army, despite being carried out with the help of the United States and the UN, was incomplete and created new security problems. In addition, the U.S. government imposed a police materials embargo on the Aristide government, crippling even further its capacity to provide security. Secretary Noriega, however, continues to blame Haiti's lack of security on Aristide. The uh, insecurity, uh, because there was no uh, rule of law in the country, was, was the way Aristide wanted it. Uh, he wanted to have these sort of uh, uh, criminal gangs uh, that he unleashed on his opponents. Aristide, however, in some of his most rousing speeches as president, frequently spoke out against crime. We put fans on us, we put gas on us, to be able to combat the misery, to be able to tolerate the security in the country. Moi vle, moi décidé pour tout haïtien vivre en paix. Là on a place publique, il faut sentir à l'aise. Il faut pas qu'il sauter. Il faut que ça gagne d'eau, pas qu'il vienne aux émenacés. Le pays a c'est pour nous lié. Le pays a c'est pour nous tous lié. Ou pas qu'il déjà dans la misère. Et puis pour qu'on y a pour criminel comprendre la force vie avec les autres. Nous ne pouvons pas tolérer ça. Nous ne pouvons pas tolérer ça. For James Dobbins, the cycle of violence in Haiti that began long before Aristide's presidency is not necessarily an inherent problem, but rather one promoted by a lack of assistance from the international community.
I mean, you know, they say that, that history repeats itself first as tragedy and then as farce. In Haiti's case, it's always tragedy. Uh, Aristide is the 35th Haitian president to be driven from office. Um, this is the fourth American intervention in 90 years. Aristide himself has been driven from office twice. Um, everything seems to come around and repeat itself in endless cycles. Um, uh, how do we break this cycle? It's not going to happen in a year or two. Uh, it's only going to happen through an extended application of uh, international engagement. So you don't, you don't have an alternative in Haiti. It's, it's too weak to uh, isolate and cut off assistance unless you're prepared to follow that up with a military intervention. Rather than blaming the international community, however, Secretary Noriega believes the political violence in Haiti is mostly the result of Aristide's leadership. President Aristide didn't just make mistakes. Uh, I think he willfully uh, misgoverned. He undermined the rule of law at every turn. He denied uh, political opponents an opportunity to contrib contribute and participate peacefully in, in the government of the country. Uh, so it's, it's a failure in, in, uh, of, of the person, but it's a willful decision on his part. Uh, and eventually he paid the price for that because he uh, lost uh, his ability to control these, uh, the whirlwind of violence that he had unleashed on the country for a decade. Do you have evidence that supports these allegations against President Aristide? We know his record. I indicated to you that uh, uh, at least a half a dozen prominent killings of political opponents took place, uh, hit squads operating out of the National Palace from using weapons, and we have the ballistic information that proves this, that were out of the inventory of the palace security unit, which was directly uh, accountable to him. His key security aides were, are implicated uh, in these uh, political murders. Uh, so we think that that's uh, the way the, the, the men operated. Uh, and in recent, uh, in recent weeks, we see his supporters uh, th threatening to behead people. And indeed, people are beheaded. Do, are we witnesses to this? No. Uh, but I think we can draw certain conclusions uh, about who is wielding uh, this kind of political violence. But for Brian Con Cannon, who has investigated human rights abuses in Haiti since the early 1990s, these accusations are baseless. Now, I, I would say that Jean-Claude Duvalier stole hundreds of millions of dollars. I would say that the de facto regime gave guns to civilians to commit human rights violations because I have the documents to prove it. Uh, the, those accusations keep getting made against Aristide, and again, there's no proof. And it, it's a source of continual frustration that those types of accusations keep getting out there and, and people credit them without asking for the normal standards of proof that, that you would ask for in any kind of a case. It's time for those people who think they have something concrete uh, that they can share about Mr. Aristide that should have led to the ouster of a democratically elected president to put it on the line. When you look at the situation today, even with UN troops on the ground, and you look at the situation before February 29th, Okay, it's certainly in 2001 and 2002, and, and even during most of 2003, Aristide performed a miracle. With somebody who had no money, 3,000 police, he was able to keep, the, in effect, the lid on everything. Haitian people continue on the ground to say yes to our president and we want him to be back, it's because they believe in democratic values. They 
voted for a president. The mandate was for five years. A good number, unfortunately, were killed for that, for defending an elected president, an elected government, and others today are killed just because they continue to ask for the respect of the vote, showing the commitment to live in a peaceful and democratic society. While their supporters march for the return of the president they elected four years ago, the Lavalas leadership remains in Haitian prisons, or in exile. One of those leaders is Mario Dupuy. When interviewed in Miami, he argued that political repression has not confused the Lavalas party structure. Family Lavalas n'a pas de problème de leadership. Si vous allez n'importe où en Haïti, dans la section communale la plus reculée, vous demandez à un Haïtien qui est le chef de Famille Lavalas, il vous répondra Jean-Bertrand Aristide. Donc, l'organisation n'a pas de problème de leadership. Donc, c'est un leadership reconnu et incontesté au sein de l'organisation. Yet, for Gerard Latortou, Haiti's interim prime minister, the Lavalas party structure must change. Oui, pour vous dire la vérité, pour moi, le président Aristide, c'est déjà le passé. Je ne voudrais pas même revenir. Et surtout ça, mais n'empêche qu'il exerce un pouvoir et sur certains de ses partisans. Peut-être qu'il continuera à l'exercer aussi longtemps que peut-être Hitler ne cesse d'exercer une influence sur l'extrême droite du monde entier. Nous invitons tous les partis politiques, y compris le parti Lavalas de M. Aristide, à joindre le processus électoral parce que, comme on le sait bien, dans une démocratie, le pouvoir ne peut s'acquérir que par les urnes, par le vote et non pas par, la, par les armes. Comment voulez-vous, moralement, politiquement, nous puissions demander à la population d'aller participer dans un processus électoral sans garantie et à Formula Blas de participer dans des élections quand ces dirigeants Ces cadres sont en exil. La preuve, son représentant national est en exil, le président de la République. Ses dirigeants connus et influents sont en prison. Ils vont les tuer, les compagnies, sont en etc. Yet the accusation that human rights abuses and political repression have become rampant in Haiti since the coup is not coming only from Lavalas members. Alarmed by the horrific reports he was hearing from his contacts in Haiti, Thomas Griffin, a decorated U.S. attorney who was the first to document the human rights abuses in Haiti under the interim government, returned last November with a team from the University of Miami to conduct a more thorough investigation. I came back with probably 200, over 200 photographs and about 300 pages of notes and some tape recordings. I saw things that people are never supposed to see, uh, that are just inhuman. I mean, my, my report does show plenty of pictures of bodies that you just see. I mean, their daily life is to walk by a body that's being eaten by a dog because it was killed, you know, the night before. You know, or the police had charged through and shot a lot of people the day before. His report concludes that after 10 months under an interim government backed by the U.S. and France, Summary executions carried out by the Haitian National Police are routine. Haiti's brutal and disbanded army has returned to occupy much of the countryside. And former members of Aristide's administration and Lavalas leaders fill Haiti's prisons with no real charges brought against them. The most articulate voices and the most spirited voices for democracy in Haiti are being allowed to die from starvation and from violence. It's a, it's, a, it's a setback that's, that's multiple decades backwards. Everything's broken, um, and everybody knows it. In February of 2005, we encountered what the UN called a cleaning operation in the Port-au-Prince slum Bel Air. Amidst this heavily armed presence, few dared to appear on camera or speak to us about Aristide or Lavalas. Je ne suis pas croisé à vie, je suis sans trop pas réalisé rien. Et ton nom m'a fini blanchi dans tes ténades. Tout 
temps, à temps, mais où ça l'est pour tourner pour attendre. C'est utile ce qu'ils font dans la rue. Oui. oui. Il a... Aïssi lui-même son président de gentil. Aïssi, c'est Aïssi lui-même métier. Aïssi de bas nous métier. Ça veut dire tout. Côté nous vivons malade là tout. Si tu es là, tu as bien soin dans l'hôpital là. L'hôpital là, pas de craser comme ça si Aïssi est là. L'hôpital là, pas de bonne grève comme ça. Ça veut dire que tu es toujours jeune aide. Aïssi lui-même, il fait à un pic pour. Si Aïssi était là, malgré ça, pas d'appui pour ça. Il ne fait pas de à pour ça. Il fait assez ou pas assez Il fait un pile pour pauvre. Il fait plus que maintenant Il fait pour un pile pour pauvre. Et ça fait, il ne fait pas de pauvre. Il faut voir Aïssi de bas nous-mêmes. Qui est-ce que nous avons gardé Qui est-ce que nous avons gardé Je ne sais pas si je suis mal dans le monde là. Parce que pour me souffrir à terre moi-même, je suis plutôt mal dans le monde là. Despite economic embargoes imposed from abroad, relentless attempts on his life, and ceaseless criticism leveled by foreign governments and wealthy elites, President Aristide is proud of what he was able to accomplish while in office. My predecessor had an embargo, economic embargo imposed on the country. And when I had that as a legacy, it was reinforced by the U.S. not willing my government to get the credit to implement social programs. Despite of that, we could do more than when Duvalier's regime for 30 years and others did in the past. In 190 years, we had only 34 secondary public schools. When we compare our mandates, we will realize we could move from 34 to 138 secondary public schools. It was not normal after 200 years of independence to have only 1.5 Haitian doctors for each 11,000 people. Despite of the economic embargo, we invested in building a university. There we already have a medical school with 234 students. And unfortunately, they had to leave when the kidnapping or the coup d'etat happened last February. So we trust human beings. We invest in human beings. When you say what's Aristide's future, you're also saying what's Haiti's future. You know, it's not easy to, you know, erase people's memories. And the people who I'm around, you know, the patients, people in the hills, as you said, they're, you know, they're very attached to this guy and they're not going to forget about him. Aristide is a phenomenally charismatic person. Aristide could sit down and talk with you and you would believe him. Later on you'd say, but how could I believe that? Very often charismatic people get caught up in their own charisma and lose track of what is necessary on the ground. And I think that happened in the case of Aristide. Aristide's ascension was not this overnight fame of some actor playing out his life at that particular moment. Aristide's ascension was a manifestation of a yearning that people had. 
a desire that people had, a chance that they took, a risk that they took. And those are the, those are the real losers in the game. The, the cheap fix is not really going to work. Haiti needed considerable amount of fund from the international community to build up its justice system, to build up its, its internal security system, the police, whatever you want to call it, while the interim government was in place. The interim government has not been able to do any of this, and you're left with a situation where you're going to elect somebody, and that person is going to be pretty much in the position of Aristide, either in his first election or his second. That is not a, a good prospect. I wonder how some people will be able to look at themselves in a mirror one day. Their sons, their relatives, when they will be seeing what they did in 2004, how will they react? You can do your best to kill the truth, but you will not be able to kill it. The Haitian people, despite of so many people, thousands they were killed, although the United Nations are there, they continue to demonstrate. All right, everybody. Um, glad um, that you know to see you guys in the chat and stuff like that. And all right, everybody. Um, hold on one. Glad um, that you know to see you guys in the chat and stuff <laughs> like that. And uh, okay, there we go. All right. So yeah, glad to see you guys in the chat and everything. And um, uh, glad to see you guys. You know, stuck around for the the whole thing. It was kind of hard. Uh, I saw Craig in the chat saying it was kind of hard, and it is kind of hard to watch because. Um, the ops that they got on there, man, they're just like <laughs> the things they would say is just uh, it's like amazing how like you can continue to say things that just don't make any sense, that are clearly lies. You don't have any evidence and you can admit part of that and then just but continue to to. To just tell lies and 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 bend the truth and stuff like that, it's crazy to me. Um, but yeah, so yeah, we'll get into the discussions a little bit. Um, it's just me, so um, um, so I'll uh, I want to talk about um, Zach put in the chat that um, there wasn't much talk about like the other Caribbean nations with uh within the documentary, um, and so I wanted to like we'll touch on um the recent hood communist article uh that was uh written by Professor uh. Um, Tamanisha John or Tam uh, Tamanisha John. I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce her name. If I'm pronouncing it wrong, I apologize. Uh, but yeah, she wrote a recent um, article in Hood Communist um, on Haiti and uh, really tied in Jamaica um, and how their and, and their role in the the, the continued destabilization of Haiti um, and not just the Dominican Republic and um, you know Western nations like the U.S. and France and obviously Canada as well, but um, yeah, she brought in uh, Jamaica rule, so we'll we'll um, we'll bring that up too. 
Um, but yeah, so yeah, we'll get um, yeah, uh, Zach in the chat say yeah, vibes and lies. That's all they. That's all the ops had in the um, um, in the documentary. It was crazy. Like um, obviously you had um, the Noriega guy who was obviously part of the um, the second uh, the assistant secretary of state for I can't remember when or or for who, but I think it was uh, for George under George Bush. Um, but yeah, he was just all throughout there, just and he, he, you know, you heard him say in the end, like, you know, the um, the interviewer asked him, like, do you have evidence for what you're saying? And he's like, oh, we know his record, like that means something. We know his record, and you bring up ballistics and stuff like that. And he said half a dozen political members had been killed by the Lava Lost Party, which was um, um, the party created by um, Don Bertrand, uh, Aristide, and it's just you know. It's just ridiculous. And so, you know, then you got the white folks who are there also doing, you know, good investigative journalism who are like, bro, like, you guys are lying. You guys haven't brought any evidence. I have, you know, we have evidence of stuff of, you know, the opposite happening where, you know, um, the opposition parties and stuff like that. They're the ones carrying out um, these attacks on people and murdering people in cold blood, as we, you know, unfortunately saw. Um but yeah, they don't care about like the truth. They can because they can lie, and and they know that um, at the very least, you know, they can lie as long as they as long as they need to. They'll continue making money the whole time. Um, and so yeah, so real quick, I'm about to share my screen so we can see part of this um, Tamanisa John um, article on the communist. If I can get to. It. Okay. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay. So yeah, so this is the article that I was talking about that Tamanisa John wrote in the in Hood Communist just on Thursday. Um and it was it was re it was printed in um Black Agenda Report, I'm pretty sure first and you know, but yeah. Um so I wanted to highlight this this part um yeah this part of her article because I think it's um I think it's important. Back up back up. I'm not used to the max, bro. Okay, there. So in this, in this, in this paragraph right here, she talks about in order to maintain the situ. God damn it! What the hell? In order to maintain the situation and to strengthen aspirations for a continuous site of cheap exploitation, and she's talking about Haiti right here. Um, Haiti is the most intervened in country in the hemisphere, and you know we heard from the documentary that um, um, you know, thirty five presidents had been had been um overthrown and deposed and we know that um i think it's like four or five times at least that the country's been invaded uh by um the cia and um its neighbors um in the dominican republic um and yeah so yeah i think four or five times in the past since the 1900s has been invaded and then if we go back obviously to uh pre-revolution times um uh, pre Haitian Revolution times um, and uh, and after, as we heard in the documentary, that they've been it's just ridiculous how many times they've been invaded, um, threatened to be invaded, or you know whatever. Um, and so yeah, so yeah, so yeah. She says, worse yet, when we consider interventions into Haiti by Canada, for example, we see how it has been enabled by Haiti's own neighbors like Jamaica. And so this is where she gets into uh, talking about Jamaica and its role in the stabilization of Haiti. And she says in 19, in the 1990s, when Aristide was first ousted from Haiti by a CIA-backed coup, de, uh, coup d'etat, weapons sent to Haiti from apartheid South Africa, of course, apartheid South Africa, landed in Kingston first. So, you know, the, uh, you know, the U.S. tried to act, they used to try and act like during uh, apartheid that they didn't actually, you know, mess with apartheid. They would say little things like, oh yeah, things need to clear up and we need to be better and all like, they used to try to play the game. Um, and then I honestly think they even they even did 
um, they did a little embargo on South Africa too, after a while, after like, you know, the pressure got too hard. Um, but we see that, you know, in the 1990s, in 19, uh, in 1990, uh, when R. Steed was first elected, that they sent weapons from apartheid South Africa to Kingston that ended up, you know, um, that ended up, uh, who ended up playing a role in the first, in the first coup d'etat against uh, uh, Jean Bertrand and Aristide. And then she says, after the second coup against Aristide in 2004, weapons sent to Haiti from South Africa again, you know, after apartheid, and that, you know, um, we are, you know, it, 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 you know, it's unfortunate who we don't know where exactly in, you know, if it was from the South African government or it was from, you know, um, some type of corporations and stuff like that in South Africa. But either way, they got from South Africa to Jamaica before being sent to Haiti. And, you know, she says this highlights the crucial role of Jamaica as an arms shipment site into Haiti. Um, and she gives us uh, she gives a, a source to it and it's down at the bottom of the article. Um but yeah, she talks about how um, she just talks. She goes on to say about how the conservative government in Jamaica, it's just. It's in cahoots with with the West and uh, specifically the U.S., obviously, but also in Canada. Um, she talks about how there's a there's a, um, a Canada, a Canadian military base down here. Canada has its own Latin America and the Caribbean military base um, in Jamaica. Um which she says specifies Haiti as a military intervention while using seaports and airports in Jamaica's capital as the staging post. And so, you know, Jamaica and Haiti are extremely close. Like they're in Cuba's right there as well. So um, obviously you got um, Haiti and the Dominican Republic literally on the same island, <laughs> separated by like just nothing, just a, a, a ridiculous colonial border. Um, and then Jamaica, I'm pretty sure, is a little bit farther southeast. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a little bit farther southeast. And so uh, and then Cuba is obviously a little bit to the um, to the west, uh, southwest. So you, they're all like right here. And you got Jamaica. Who literally has been just beholden to Western powers. Um, you know, for for decades now. Um, and so, yeah, she, she she talks up, she gets about, she gets into that um, in the, this next paragraph. And down here, she says, shortly after independence, Jamaica allowed states like Canada to conduct espionage operations from Kingston against Cuba, Venezuela, I mean, Venezuela and Haiti um, and other countries in the West, uh, uh, other countries which the West had a fear of growing communism or socialism. Um I think she ends up somewhere in here. I don't know if it's in this one, but she mentions um, that they were uh, Jamaica was also involved in the um, in the Granada um, invasion that overthrew the um, the, the uh, Maurice Bishop and the New Jewel movement, and um, you know their uh, their government um, in Granada, and all, you know obviously ended up murdering um, Maurice Bishop and top officials in Granada um, in nineteen in the nineteen eighties, the early nineteen eighties. So. Jamaica has been that's it's the, the documentary did mention it. And that's, you know, part of the what we want to what I wanted to uh, look at Tamanisha John's article for, because, you know, as Zach said in the chat, there wasn't much mention of the other Caribbean nations in the documentary, except for um, the Dominican Republic's role. You know, um, one of the aides to Aristide talked about. Um, he talked about in the documentary how. Um, you know, some of the some of the um, the leaders of the coup of the military coup were directly trained, um, came from the Dominican Republic, um, uh, were directly trained by the uh, the Dominican Republic um, uh, military and um, defense uh, department. And then that they also were beholden to the wheels and the um, the aspirations of the defense department in the U.S. And so. um but yeah, other than that, they did. There was no mention of Jamaica. There was no mention of you know um, Cuba's uh, Cuba's role really in trying to help Haiti, if at all possible. But I do know that just a year ago, when Jean Bertrand, uh, when Jean Bertrand Aristide came back to Haiti, um, he had to go to Cuba for medical help um, for something for some uh, for some issue that he had. So you know. 
you, we know what Cuba's always willing to do in terms of um in terms of um um aid um in, it's as far as um <laughs> as far as aid in uh in terms of uh, medical aid and stuff like that and willing to you know take in doctors and train doctors and also send doctors out and also you know bring in uh folks like uh our steed air steed who um need assistance and stuff like that need medical assistance and so yeah um hold on let me check that. i'm gonna stop sharing my screen real quick So yeah, um, I just wanted to you know talk about that and uh, mention that and stuff like that. And um, if any, uh, see if anyone else has any thoughts. You know, you can always uh, put it in the chat and stuff like that. Um, but also, it was just it was hard to watch. Um, you know, just the lack of like respect for human life um, that goes on with the wealthy elite in Haiti and stuff like that. And, um, and obviously aided by the U S um, we talked about in the chat a little bit, how like, you know, um, they were, you know, they talked about, you know, we were talking about in the chat, how essentially Haiti in it mentioned in the documentary as well about like, like the notion that Haiti is too poor. The people of Haiti are too poor to, to the, to demand justice and stuff like that. Um, you know, we heard um, in the documentary, it, they had people who were um, critical of Aristide for demanding the money that was essentially stolen was was forced uh, that they were forced to give up um, after the revolution in the eighteen hundred in um, eighteen oh one. So they were literally Haiti. We know well, some of us know in um, um, the case that Haiti had to essentially pay France. 90 million francs i don't know how much that is but i know it's a lot in the in the documentary that i think it um in 2004 it um um it translated into i think they said 21 or 23 billion dollars that um france essentially stole from from haiti um because they france essentially made haiti pay for stealing the haitian colony from them the 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 colony of saint uh santo domingue and so, um, yeah, like, it's just, it's crazy how, you know, stuff like that can happen. And, you know, you, you get the people in the documentary saying that, oh, well, that's, you know, that's the past, that's history. Um, you can't, we can't ask the, the Spanish government to pay for the conquistadors. And it's like, this is, these are two completely different situations. Not only did you, um, not only did you take the money by force and not only did you um by threatening um to invade and threatening to uh, reinstitute slavery on the island but like the whole thing that's why the whole thing came from slavery so the notion that Haiti should should have had to pay France for essentially losing slaves you know freeing themselves is just ridiculous and so these are two completely different situations that, you know, these people want to try and bring up, oh, it's history. Well, not only did you do that, but you continue to oppress this nation throughout the 1800s, you know, um, always threatening to invade. Um, obviously, you know, we know in the um, in the film it talked about um, um, Poisson Lou, uh, Louvator, who was um, who they kidnapped and then took to France and um, had him die in a in a in a jail um, two years after, you know, he led the revolution. Um, and Emma Emma mentioned in the chat that they didn't mention Dessalines, uh Dessalines in the um in the <laughs> in the documentary. And that is like extremely unfortunate, extremely unfortunate. Um but she said, you know, she mentioned in the chat that Desal uh Dessalines always uh spooks them. And so like she didn't expect, you know, anything from them. And that's true because, you know, he Dessalines, like he he's he's always the unsung hero, but I, that's why we love uh the black Jacobins. Because um, CLR James gets into his history a lot and stuff like that, and um, and just how influential he was to the early years of eighty and stuff like that. Obviously, not perfect. We know this, but um, yeah, it was it was a surprise to not hear them mention Desoyens in the um, in the documentary. Um, Zach put in the chat: um, the payment was later reduced to ninety million francs in um, eighteen thirty eight, comparable uh, comparable to U.S. 
21 uh to 21 billion dollars in the US as of 2004 with Haiti paying about 112 million francs in total which is you know ridiculous so like it's just you know that continued it's not like that money wasn't there you know what i mean it's not like that wealth and that um wasn't there they had it it's theirs and they could have whatever you say about how it would have happened, it would have been theirs. They wouldn't have had to continuously give away, which they've done throughout their history. So you can say, um, oh, you know, whatever happened um, in the 1800s was history, but you continued to collect the money, did you not? Like throughout the 1800s, throughout the 1900s, I think I'm pretty sure, um, I can't remember when they ended up stopped paying, um, but it was in the 20th century. And so to suggest that, that's history. Like it's wasn't ongoing and you weren't continuously um, um, trying to destabilize the country as we heard the, uh, the American official um, try and point the finger at Europe, even though they obviously they deserve it. But the finger pointing was funny to me. Um, Europe, I mean, France had a continued uh, and still continues to this day to have uh, a hand in the destabilization of Haiti. And it's just ridiculous to, you know, but that's how they try to do it. You know, they try to paint everything as like, oh, that happened in the past. Let's get over it. Well, we can't get over it because you've not, you use that wealth to build up France. So if it's history, the history is right in front of our face every single day. When we see the, the, the state Haiti is in, when we see when they try to elect their own, uh, they try to elect their own president that they know that they believe will help serve them. You, you just, you won't let them live. And then we see, we see France and it's touted as this, you know, um, metro, it is a metropolitan state with, you know, um, wealth, but we know that that wealth was looted literally. Okay. So from Haiti and, and, and uh, obviously the various parts of Africa from, from various parts of Asia. So for these French officials to suggest that things are history, is um it's one of them things it's one of them funny things that like of course they would say stuff like that um oh yeah yeah zach said don't expect nothing from france yeah we can't expect anything from france they like i really can't stand france they're one of the they're one of you know it's not like a competition but like them motherfuckers are so the the ruling elite in france and i want to make it i don't want to make it seem like it's french people specifically that's you know I don't want to make it seem like that. It's the French elite and the the ruling class in France who are um, obviously a part of the European elite, the Euro American elite, who have continuously been some of the most corrupt people in history um, and the the most murderous and destructive people in history. Um, and so yeah, um, Nubian X in the uh, in the chat also said the time is right right now for an international black revolution. And many of us are ready to step out hard to get it started and go strong to make it happen. Um, yeah, and I think part of that, you know, part of that revolution, the, the African revolution, the global African revolution is understanding that these people don't, that we are one, we are one people. And so, you know, the only reason, you know, the only reason why some of us who are watching this documentary aren't in Haiti or haven't been, um, you know, don't live in Haiti, aren't from Haiti, um, it's just it's just because of the way that the uh, you know the the European um, trade and traffic of 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 Africans happened. You know they decided to take some of us down to Haiti, some of us um, in Venezuela, um, you know, some of us in Colombia, and then obviously some of us here in the um, up here in North America in the in on Turtle Island and the snakes, and so. Um, it's just important to remember that part of that, you know, we have to like get folks to realize that we are one people and that, you know, um, there shouldn't be, you know, the, the Africans who are in Jamaica shouldn't be willing to, to help oppress their, uh, you know, their, their, their family, their people in Haiti. Um, obviously we know what the Dominican Dominican Republic's role in the destabilization of Haiti. And it's just, Part of the revolution has to be recognizing that these are our people and it's not these governments, especially not the Western governments um, who 
we should be beholden to. There is no we when it comes to like living in any of these places. We should refer to Africans as a whole, whether we be on the continent, whether we be in Europe, whether we be in Western Asia, um, uh, whether we be here in North America or uh, the Caribbean or Latin America, wherever we're the, wherever the hell we're at. Um, we should and we have to be able to get to the point that it's us against them. You know, the, the war on, it, it, there's, there's, it's been a war on African people in Africa, the continent as a whole. And so, you know, it ended up being stretched over here into the Western Hemisphere and stuff like that. And um, we know our role and our position in other nations around the globe, but that's a part of the continued war on African people. And so like, you know, part of that revolution that Nubian X is mentioned, and it has to be um, that mindset, the ideological aspect of it to try and help our people understand that there is no we. So, you know, when you see people talk about, um, the, the 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 trade that the the trade that happened that brought Brit, uh that brought Brittany Griner out of um, Russian prison and you know back to the United States and you hear and see people on Facebook and Twitter and wherever the hell you you know you're at talk about oh we traded a arms dealer for Brittany Griner we should have made a different decision we are tripping. Why did we do something like that? We should have brought home the 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 uh, the marine instead of the basketball player. We're just already like you're already. No matter how you feel about it, once you start saying we, you're already down bad. You know what I mean? You're not. You're already not analyzing it in the right situation because there is no we. Um, the United States does not represent us, and we do not. Uh, we are a colonized nation of people inside this nation. And so there is no we in terms of us and them and when us by, you know, the African people and all colonized people and the United States government and the, the, the bourgeoisie and the ruling elite. We are not, the, you know, we are not <laughs> a, a conglomerate group of people. You know what I mean? Um, and so we have to start thinking like that. We have to start think like, you know, I hear Daruba bin Wahad talk about all the time. We all hear him talk about all the time. We have to start thinking sovereignly. And so until we do that, you know, the 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 the, the actual fighting, I believe, can't even take place because what are you know, people don't know what you're fighting for. Um <laughs> you know, you know, the why would I fight the US government? That's us. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, Zach mentioned uh, Mali kicking out French control, uh, French control of uh, NGOs, and yeah, you definitely love to see it. Mali and a lot of the the Sahel um, and parts of Western Africa, and really just French dominated air, uh, French, formerly French, formerly colonized nation, formerly French colonized nations in Africa, um, and ones that France still has their hand in. Um, they're really like growing in that 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 um, that revolutionary fervor and trying to. Um, remove the 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 former so called former colonizers from their nation. And France is, you know, France is uh, like their foot, their handprint, and their 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 destruction um, is all over Africa. It's imprinted all over Africa, and so um, yeah, that boot, that footprint is all over Africa, and so. We know that it's been. There was times back in the day, you know, when Sekou Touré. Um, um in Guinea and um uh and other uh colonized uh French colonized nations had band together and formed like a you know like a um they formed a like a they formed up and teamed up um to oust the French together as a as a as a unit and so that was you know stuff like that has to continue to happen and it's you know it's it's good to see always and especially Mali you know Mali's act you know Molly's doing the thing right now. And so we always salute our people out there um, on the continent. And Mali is one of those places. Um, Malawi also, you know, trying to do real good things in Malawi and um, um, other places as well, obviously. Um, so, yeah. Um, Nubian X also says in the chat, the work has already started, but we need to establish a foundation, a foundational mega coalition to unite power and strategy to step to the next level and start making some noise and things happen for our benefit. 
definitely. And I, I think it was Salifu, who I don't know if he's still in the chat, but um, he came in and we always love to see uh, Comrade Salifu, who's a, a editor at uh, Hood Communist um, as well, as well as a, a member of BAT and, um, <laughs> and the AAPRP. So, yeah, Salifu mentioned in the chat that uh, I'm pretty sure it was him. I seen him uh, uh, post about it on Facebook that there is not going to be like a perfect time um, to, you know, start things and stuff like that. Like we can't wait for like any perfect situation to arise um, in the belly of the beast to, 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 to get our feet going. We have to like um, we have to start creating, you know, and have our the those of us that can um come together and for and you know start beginning our own internal dynamism that at least can create some of the situations that we need to that we want to see arise but there is no waiting for it to happen um yeah salute to salifu for sure yeah but the, yeah there is no waiting for that shit to happen like uh because it's never going to happen the perfect situation is never going to be there um for us to be like oh this is the moment let's do it now like that <laughs> Uh, we'll be waiting for forever and then we'll, you know, uh, nothing will ever get done. So we have to, um, we have to have our own internal dynamism and start, um, start pushing contradictions ourselves. Um, and that's another, that's, you know, that's that, um, especially as it relates to Haiti, that's part of what, like, that's part of, that's part of this whole, that's part of what we have to do um is because haiti is we can't let our first the only the the first revolution the first true revolution um i don't know what to say in history but the first true revolution of uh um really the common era um we can't and our revolution um our african revolution we can't let that we can't let them like continue to fuck over like our shining, our shining star and stuff like that. We can't, we can't continue to let that happen. So um, part of like pushing contradictions is to highlight the, 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 the current destabilization of Haiti by um, the nation that we live under. So like while we're here, those are the type of, um, those are the type of, um, agitations we can make by constantly bringing up Haiti, constantly um, agitating for the release of the noose on, on our, on our, on our people's necks. Um, and to show them that like, yeah, we, we, we can think internationally. We can, we are an international people. This is an international um, issue. Um, and it's not, we're not going to just stick to, to, um, to things that are happening to us in the United States. We're going to start thinking internationally because we are a sovereign people. And we see that um, one of our people's nations is being controlled by wealthy elite that are funded by the nation that we're a part of. And, uh, you know, honestly, part of, part of our um, tax dollars, we are honestly paying to have our own people be oppressed um, in Haiti. And so that's part of the shit that like can help um, by constantly agitating and constantly trying to think internationally um, with our demands, with our um, with our activism, with our organizing is always trying to bring in um, uh, the global African perspective and how imperialism and capitalism is um, was designed off of the, the exploitation and um, and um, the exploitation of Africa and its people, um, and as well as the the indigenous people in the Western Hemisphere, um, and the theft of land. So that's you know yeah like you know what Nubian X talks about in the chat and stuff like that, and what you know what Salifu mentioned is all like extremely relevant and extremely true. And um, Haiti and just you know the we see like you know. Um, their president was just their, you know, whatever we think about them, but you know, they had, he was just murdered just last year or maybe earlier this year. I can't even remember time is warped right now, obviously, but you know, uh, another one. So, you know, they had another coup, um, in which the, the, the man lost his life. And we, um, I'm pretty sure there's articles on black agenda report as well that detail, you know, um, the fact that the U S also had a hand 
um, or at the very least, people backed by the U.S. had a hand in the murder of the um, of the president of, of one of the presidents of Haiti just last year. And so these things are ongoing and they never end um, until we decide to end them, until we decide to act. And we have to act as a as a whole, as a unit, as much as we can internationally. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I will I'll wrap up in a few because I actually have to go to work, um, unfortunately. Um, so I'll wrap up in a few, but I did want to also just talk about um, I wanted to talk about um, just the 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 like the emotional toll that it takes on our people in Haiti in their continued resistance. Like they don't ever give up. Like it's just it's honestly amazing to me, and it's like it's like a it's like really heart wrenching to see because um, you see the you see the destabilization, and it's not like they haven't. It's not like they're not trying to get free, but they're facing like opposition from every angle. And they were already set up in a fucked up position because of part of the, obviously because of the money that they had to continuously pay to France um, for in, for freeing themselves, for being the first people to say, fuck off. We're about to beat back all of y'all. And so, you know, we know that they beat back three different European um, armies um in the uh in the um the early 1800s in the revolution and so the penalty that they've had to pay is just so the penalty that they have to pay by you know um uh, from the the boot and the, the 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 just like inhumane nature in the the callous nature um the capitalistic nature of um of these western nations um is just it's it's ridiculous. And but like the fact is like that that they've never quit. So they never stopped when they barely talked about it in the in the documentary. And that was another thing I kind of didn't I wish they would have delved more into um Duvalier and that punk ass that punk ass dude who um both of the Duviers, the senior and the I mean, you know, the dad and the son, um, and how their their hand like what they did to help destabilize their own nation and their own people. And um, I wish we would have talked a little bit more about them, but you know, um, it's just, it's just extremely unfortunate because they, they, you know, during the Duvier years, it, it wasn't like the people weren't rising up and weren't fighting back. They were, and that's why they were literally getting their ass. They were getting murdered for it. Um, and that still didn't stop them because, you know, a couple of years after the sun was deposed in the um, in the mid to late 80s, that's when they dis that's when they finally felt free enough to actually vote after, you know, they finally felt free enough to actually vote in a person that they believed would treat them at least a little bit better. You know what I mean? And at least adhere to some of the things that he said he would do during his campaign. And so that's when they, you know, they, in 1990, that's when they voted for Aristide. And so like they're, they haven't not, they, they've been resisting this whole time. They, they reelected the dude that they reelected my man Aristide when he came back, they were calling for him to come back. And the second he came back, they're like, yep, we want him again. And so it's just, we see continually the, the the strikes and the protests from from women in these factories and um, burning down things because they're not happy and they want change and they want things to they want things to be different. They're constantly figuring out different ways and new ways to try and gain their liberation and gain their freedom and uh, uh, oppose the foreign and and local domination of the people. They don't want that shit and they continuously fight and continuously fight and. Um, it's the only reason why they haven't succeeded like they should have is because of the lack of of international support, whether it's, you know, obviously some of it, you know, nations probably would try and help Cuba, but they can't. But also the international support from us, from our own people, you know, from from Africans in the U.S., from Africans in France. Um, and I'm not saying we don't do anything because we know that we do stuff and we know that um BAP has their Haiti team that that does great work. We know um, 
they're there we do great work around it it's just it just hasn't been enough and that's you know that that's part of the reason why they can't get these boots off their backs because they got they're fighting 30 motherfuckers <laughs> and it's just them and so like and they're they're already at a put at a disadvantage at a disadvantageous position so it's hard for them to you know you know climb out from the mud and fight all these people at the same time without like the support that is necessary that like would actually help. And so, you know, I just wanted to always mention that because, you know, we talk about, and they kind of, they, they kind of got into some of that in the documentary where, you know, you hear that notion about Haiti being, they didn't say it specifically in the documentary, but we've heard that notion that Haiti's just cursed. It's, it's always doom and gloom for Haiti. And I'm not saying, obviously we know that it, it's been a struggle since the revolution and before it, obviously. Um, but, that that resistance has to matter that we have to also congruent um we also have to hear about the resistance along with you know the oppression because you get them you'd get the you'd get the the idea that they were just like that they're just um that this just happens and they're they're either cursed or that they're they're oh well they don't want to fight back they're not fighting back they're not winning and getting what they deserve because they're not fighting back no like Every time they try and fight back and try to get something done, there's always a hand. Hillary Clinton steps in and says, oh, no, you can't actually raise the minimum wage this much because I'm in, you know, I have I'm in cahoots with um, places like um, Ross and um, the wall and Walmart and some of these sweatshop factories. And, you know, they don't want that. So I don't want, you know, I don't really want it either. So so every time they try and do something, there's always a hand. And, you know, it's just unfortunate that, you know. The Dominican Republic is there. They share the same island. So if you're literally, you know, not the 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 the, the nonsense that America be saying, but your literal next door neighbor is attacking you continuously with weapons from the motherfuckers across the street. Like. And then you got people down the block who's who's giving them guns to giving them training. Then you got people um, across the city. Who, you know, they got weapons, you know, like the South, you know, it was crazy to just hear about, you know, in Tamanisha John's article that, you know, they're getting weapons from South Africa. Um, also, she mentioned in the article, I'm sorry, real quick, um, she mentioned in the article about Taiwan and how Ty, uh, they talk about how t they want Haiti to become the Taiwan of, of the Western Hemisphere. So, you know, that we get a lot of things from Taiwan, um, which I just want to mention is a part of China. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, they want the, the, the geographic area, obviously Haiti's closer to the U S and to Canada than, than, um, than Taiwan. And just that, that whole nature, they're, they're scared of China too. So like the, I, as much as they try and provoke it, you know, and stuff like that, and they try to provoke these things with Taiwan and China, they, you know, I don't, you know, they know they don't really want that smoke, but either way, uh, sorry to devolve and stuff like that. Uh, but either way, they want um, Tamanisha John mentioned in the Hood Communist article that they want Haiti to become the Taiwan of the Western Hemisphere because it's closer um, and because of the, you know, the stagnant wages within Haiti that they deliberately suppress and deliberately keep down um, for their own benefit. So um, they are fighting all of these different they're fighting all of these different forces. Um, and so it's extremely hard for them to, you know actually win and so to help that on to help the african revolution to help the global african revolution that includes all of us um in the fight for for political and economic um self-determination and sovereignty um we have to we have to begin to think sovereignly and begin to um To, to display the like true internationalism at, at the like at the very least with our own people with our own African uh, with our own African family but you know we don't ever want to limit it to obviously that at all because the more the more hands we get the more solidarity we display the more um the more we love on humanity and the more we respect the struggles of people who are going through situations exactly similar to ours like like Palestine like um like western sahara like um this is my boss calling me right now it's crazy hopefully he's telling me i don't have work but we'll see uh but um 
yeah, we never want to we never want to limit our solidarity to our own people and um, our internationalism to our own people. But at like at least for a start, can we do that? Like, um, at least for a start, can we can we try and do that? Um, but yeah, so um, okay, so yeah, so yeah, that that's pretty much it, guys. And um, thank you guys for joining us. It's been a long time since I've, since we've, you know, been together and since we've, you know, talked and stuff like that. Thank you guys for joining in the chat. I appreciate it. I'm sorry. It's just me. I know you guys hate seeing my faces by myself. You guys miss Anya. I miss Anya too and stuff like that. And uh, Monica and um, Afro uh, Phoenix. Um, so yeah, um, um, we will be back again um, with uh, weekly Pan-African news real soon, real, real soon. Um, um we will be back with weekly pan african news real soon um too as well so um thank you guys for joining in and um yeah i hope everybody's just hanging in there and staying you know uh staying principled um trying to get organized and i hope everyone who's not in an organization joins an organization to that's fighting for the liberation of our people because that's what we need that's what's necessary um and that's the only way we're going to survive is through organizing our people uh for total liberation and so yeah thank you guys um and i'll see you guys soon peace out forward and forward.